So, now I'm seeing questions to start with. Could you start with a short introduction about yourself? Yeah. Um, hi. My name's David Grinspoon. I'm an astrobiologist. My background is in planetary science. My uh, research focus has been on trying to understand the evolution of planetary environments with um, a particular interest in habitability, where we can possibly search for other places in our solar system or beyond where, uh, where life could be comfortable. Uh, and, and more particularly, I'm interested in, in uh, evolution of climates on planets like our own or sort of like our own, and how uh, the, the interactions between the surfaces and atmospheres and clouds and the sort of different parts of um, a planetary system, um, how, how uh, the, those uh, different elements behave uh, with respect to one another and, and how those interactions determine the long-term evolution of climate and uh, how, how planets achieve and maintain um, what we would consider to be habitable conditions. And of course that raises a whole host of other questions like how the heck do we know what is habitable? What, what, what can we assume we know about life elsewhere? Um, and so forth. Um, I've written a couple of popular books, one on Venus called Venus Revealed, one on um, uh, extraterrestrial life and it's uh, the responses it provokes in uh, human beings called Lonely Planets, the Natural Philosophy of Alien Life. And um, right now I'm sitting here in the Library of Congress because I'm here for a year. I've been appointed as the first Chair of Astrobiology at the Library of Congress, uh, a new position designed uh, to support people that are doing research on the intersection between astrobiology and uh, wider societal questions. And my research project has to do with the, uh, the Anthropocene error. Error. <laughs> error. That was a Freudian slip. I like that. The Anthropocene error. Um, the Anthropocene era is the, is the term that geologists and some other people are giving to uh, the, the sort of phase of Earth history defined by, uh, by humans um, changing the planet. And so I'm, I'm trying to take a, a planetary science and astrobiology perspective on that. Uh, if, if we look at astrobiology as the relationship, as studying the relationship between planets and life, then arguably with the Anthropocene, we've now entered a new stage in that relationship on Earth. So how does that look like as, a, as an event in planetary evolution, the, the advent of, of human changes on Earth? And, and how does that perspective illuminate our choices going into the future and even illuminate the way we would think about the possibility of intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. Those are the questions I'm grappling with with, uh, with this year I've been granted here at the Library of Congress. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to make a note of that. I like the Anthropocene error. I might just have to use that. <laughs> this has been very useful so far. Ah, any answers yet? <laughs> um, no, no answers. I, you know, I don't really expect to. Um, this isn't the kind of project where uh, at the end of the year I think I'm going to have the answers. But I think what I do hope to have is a, a a more complete and compelling description of of the question in a sense. It's a, it, it's a real like astrobiology itself. I'm finding it's a real multidisciplinary effort. I'm meeting people interested in the Anthropocene coming from um, a background in history, philosophy, even um, I've been talking to some uh, uh, religious scholars, theologists as well, of course, as earth scientists, planetary scientists. So a lot of what I'm doing is just um, searching for these, these connections uh, between disciplines. <laughs> Ah, good. 
Um, first to, uh, to Miles' question. He says, I, I think the most obvious link is uh, between the cosmos and the Anthropocene is climate change. Uh, what do you think is the second most obvious? Wow. Well, I mean, climate change is, is, is really a lot of different things, right? We can unpack that because it's not just about, um, I mean, the most obvious link there perhaps is, um, if you dissect that, is the changes in atmospheric composition that we are bringing to Earth, the, uh, the Keeling curve, the increase in, uh, in carbon dioxide over time and how, in, in a certain sense, we are uh, veneeriforming the Earth. People talk about terraforming Mars. Well, whether we like it or not, we're veneeriforming Earth now, making it more like Venus. Um, but there are some other less obvious things where we're, we're changing the surface reflectivity of Earth. Uh, not just by the um, the uh, decomposition of the uh, of of the polar uh, ice shelves or the the retreat of of the polar ice, but by uh, changing land use patterns, um, cutting down forests, desertification, and so I think um, you know if you if you unpack the the climate change question, you find that there are, there are really a lot of uh, of components to that, but uh, go, going beyond climate change, um, there there are a lot of I, I see I see climate change as sort of the first big challenge of the Anthropocene era, <laughs> era, um, and that it, and the need to transform our energy um, supply uh, of our civilization is a, is a huge challenge. But even if we solve that, we haven't solved the fundamental dilemma of um, living in a sustainable way with more and more advanced technology as a global society. There are other capabilities. Um, a, a big one is, is uh, the uh, promise and the peril of genetic engineering combined with nanotechnology. The, the ability of individuals uh, to create very powerful agents that can transform the planet um, is something that will be with us um, long after we've solved the uh, the climate and energy problems. So um, there's a whole host of problems that point to the need for some better way to govern ourselves globally. And when I say govern, that freaks people out because they think I'm talking about world government. And uh, I may not necessarily be talking about that, but we do need some global decision-making capability just as just as life can become a planetary entity, I think intelligence needs to become a planetary entity if we're going to um, survive these challenges. And climate, uh, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm really beginning to realize is only the first of a whole series of challenges that requires we, uh, we find a different way of doing things. Um, let's see. There's some other questions popping up here. If we're alone in the universe, does astrobiology and Anthropocene say something about what we might do think about our responsibility as guardians of intelligent life? Well, yeah, if we're alone in the universe, really alone, then, then we have a much larger responsibility. As it is, I think one of the realizations of the Anthropocene that we have to become comfortable with is that we have responsibility in some sense for this planet. Uh, we, we didn't necessarily ask for it. We don't necessarily deserve it. But we're here and we're kind of running this place or we're in, we've become integral into the, the running of it. And so that's quite a responsibility. But if we are, as Sanjoy asks, somehow actually alone, and as some people have argued, I think incorrectly, um, <laughs> that, that we're really alone, then, then we are somehow the guardians of life and intelligence in the universe. I find that actually much more frightening than just thinking that we're in charge of this planet. If, we, if we're just in charge of this planet and there are a lot more experiments running out there, which I think is probably the case, then um, there's an attitude of, well, we should try our best, but if we blow it, there's plenty more where we came from. But if we're really the only ones, then, oh boy, then we, we really have an, an awesome responsibility. Um, but fortunately, I, 
I don't think that's the case. However, it doesn't really change that much how we should approach the future, right? We, we have to give it our best shot. Um, let's see. There's some more questions written down here. Um, am I optimistic? Yes. I'm optimistic because um, I, why am I optimistic? I, I'm optimistic because I think there's a lot more that we don't know than that we do know, including about our own future and the future of the earth. And so we have, that gives us the choice to be optimistic or pessimistic. And I think um, pessimism, unwarranted pessimism is lame and unproductive and uh, corrosive and contagious. So uh, as long as the range of possibilities that I logically see before us admits optimism, then I think it's a good idea to choose optimism. So, um, so that's why I'm optimistic. Let's see, what else do we got here? Um, can you really call climate change the first challenge of the Anthropocene? We've already had to deal with ozone depletion, acid rain, lead, and gasoline. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. That's a very, very good point, Michael W. Bush, um, because in a certain sense, um, there, there have been other challenges, and I think ozone is a great example because uh, in a way, you might say ozone was the first challenge of the Anthropocene and that it, it was truly a global problem. Some of these other ones are not global problems. They're local problems that are, are wide in extent. But, o, but um, ozone stratospheric ozone depletion is a global problem that we recognized and took global action to solve and it's on its way to being solved due to those global actions. And so it's actually a wonderful example that uh, an Anthropocene problem can be recognized and dealt with. Now climate change for a number of reasons is much more tricky, but I think uh, I'm glad you mentioned that, Michael, because it does give us a hopeful example of something that we've recognized and, and met. And by the way, I also have to mention that these problems, in particular the ozone problem, illustrates the, the power and the promise and, and the necessity of comparative planetology because the reason we've learned about the ozone problem and the unintended consequences that, that emitting these seemingly harmless, that emitting these seem, seem, seemingly harmless chemicals, these CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, up into our stratosphere, the, the way we became aware of that problem was through studying the upper atmosphere of Venus and trying to understand why there were not more oxygen compounds, certain kind of oxygen compounds in the upper atmosphere of Venus and then some uh, some aeronomists, the people that study the, the interactions of chemicals in the upper atmosphere said well actually chlorine can um, can destroy these oxygen molecules if there's any chlorine there and then some other alert scientists said wait a minute Chlorine destroys oxygen molecules. Well, we're putting chlorine in the Earth's stratosphere with these CFCs, and they put two and two together. And it, if it had not been for those studies of the upper atmosphere of Venus, it would have been a lot longer before we realized what we were doing to Earth's stratosphere, and we would have been um, in, a, in a more dire, dire condition. So there's, there's, a, there's a nice fable there. Technology. I'm reading another question now. Destructive force or saving grace of the Anthropocene error, or both? Well, definitely both. I mean, if it weren't for technology, or as um, as uh, Ali G calls it, technology, if it weren't for technology, then we wouldn't be in this situation, would we? But the whole point is that we are who we are. We are these creatures that invent things and discover things and like all life multiply globally and um, affect our environment in different ways and technology has allowed us to multiply our numbers to to this point where we're we're altering the earth and, and, and multiply our impact um, and and gotten us into this mess but we absolutely can't get out of this mess without technology. Uh, you know as as H.G. Wells said, 
There is no way back into the past. Our choice is the universe or nothing. You know, we don't have the option to, I think, go back to some, some pre-technological Eden. I mean, we actually do have that option if we really wanted to, if we were willing to drastically reduce our numbers on Earth, um, you know, by an order of magnitude, um, which, you know, may, nature may do for us. But, but assuming we don't choose that path, then to, to maintain ourselves, we have to keep technology, we have to refine technology and find a different relationship with it and a different relationship, a different understanding of how we interact with the planet. And, and technology is going to be a huge part of that, that solution. So it's both the problem and the solution. Um, let's see. Reading another question. Sanjoy, what are your thoughts about life elsewhere in our solar system? Venus, Mars, Titan, Europa, Enceladus, <laughs> Nibiru. <laughs> Nibiru. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think there's life on Nibiru. <laughs> that one's easy. <laughs> um, but, uh, okay. So Mars, first of all. Um, I am a pessimist about life on Mars. I think Mars is the best place to look for signs of ancient life and one of the worst places to look for present-day life. Um, it is true that there are places on Mars, places in Mars today that may have what we consider the requirements for life as far as a micro-environment. Places where a terrestrial microbe could survive. Underground on Mars, we know there's got to be places with water, places that are protected by, uh, from the uh, radiation by, uh, by all that dirt. Um, there's maybe some kind of flow of energy, although that might be the, the weak point. But Mars, to me, does not seem at all like a, a living planet. If you look at the Earth, Earth is flagrantly alive. The atmosphere is out of equilibrium. The, every surface is covered with life. The, you know, it's not subtle. The signs of life on Earth are not subtle. And I think that a planet that has had life for billions of years, as Earth has, will be flagrantly changed by a global biosphere. And Mars does not have those characteristics. Its atmosphere is stale, in equilibrium. Its surface is, is obviously not dominated by life. It's, uh, if there's life there, it's, it's extremely subtle. And I doubt you can have a global biosphere uh, on a planet like Mars and have it be as hidden as it seems to be. And I doubt you can have life on a planet for billions of years without it being a global biosphere. So my bias is against life on Mars today, although I'm absolutely in favor of continuing to search because, you know, what do I know? Um, but Mars is not the place I would look for present day life. Mars is the place I would look for ancient life because Mars has saved itself, its ancient self. It's, it's remarkably well preserved and we see many signs of a, of a place uh, in the past on Mars that could have been an origin of life. Um, you mentioned Venus. I maintain a devil's advocate attachment to the possibility of life on Venus. Not on the surface, because it's hellishly hot, but, but in the clouds. Uh, the, the clouds of Venus are a, an aqueous environment, a, a, a watery environment, not like this, uh, full, more like this full of uh, acid. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's, um, it's an acidic environment, but it's, it, it is a watery environment, and there's all kinds of energy sources and disequilibrium and chemical flows and interesting chemistry. So I, I maintain the, uh, some hope that we could surprise ourselves by finding life in the clouds of Venus. Um, as far as Titan, yeah, why not? Titan's got organic chemistry. It's got flows of liquid. Yeah, it's cold there, but there are liquid reservoirs and interesting chemistry going on, and we don't know enough about life to know that it must be liquid water and must be within a certain temperature range. Um, and, and plus, Titan has an underground ocean. So Titan's got two chances. It's got the, the methane environment with all these thermodynamic transformations and organic molecules and a possibility of some, or, uh, some exotic life, 
or it's also got the underground ocean, which we know occasionally gets organics mix, mixed into it. So, so I'll, Titan is actually my favorite environment right now for, uh, for extraterrestrial life in our solar system. Enceladus, who knows? There's water, but it doesn't seem like there's a long-term stable environment. It seems like the, the hot spots and the geysers probably turn on and off, and I don't know if it would be a good place to, to live as far as being continuously inhabitable. Uh, Europa, yeah, sure, why not? It's got water, it's got energy, it's got uh, presumably organic. So yeah, I think uh, we definitely need to go to Europa and melt through the ice with a submarine and, and search around. Um, <laughs> it's not actually a vial of acid, it's, uh, it's coffee, but it's, it's fairly acidic, believe me, the, the coffee here. Um, <laughs> um, is Venus atmosphere at all similar to any place on Earth where we have found life on Earth? Not on the surface. The surface of Venus is, is just too hot. Even for, I mean, people talk, you talk about extremophiles and how we've discovered life that can inhabit all of these different um, surprising environments. And it's true, the discovery of extremophiles has been important in our thinking about extraterrestrial environments because it expands the range of places where we could consider finding life. But there are some ultimate limits. Uh, you, uh, the surface of Venus is so hot that organic matter of any kind is just not stable. Uh, it, uh, proteins would just denature, fly apart. I mean, that heat, that heat is just molecules bouncing against each other at incredibly high speeds, and, and the nature of that heat is such that a delicate, complex thing like an organic molecule doesn't stand a chance for, you know, for a nanosecond. So there's no way you could have life on the surface of Venus unless you go for some really exotic possibilities. You, you, you know, organic, organic life just could not exist on the surface of Venus. You'd have to go for some really exotic, you know, silicon-based or, you know, you're in Star Trek territory. I can't rule it out because I think we are very ignorant about life, but but the place on Venus that, again, I'm drawn to is up in the air, up in the clouds, where it happens to be pretty much room temperature. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, we would be comfortable there if you, if you just had an oxygen mask and maybe a, a, a Kevlar suit to keep the acid, um, acid droplets off your skin. But in terms of temperature and pressure and amount of sunlight, uh, that there are a lot. There's a lot about the the upper atmosphere of or the middle atmosphere of Venus that that I think is is very promising. So let's see. Do you actually actually see Titan as a viable possibility when the water layer isn't in contact with the rock mantle? Uh, that's a that's a good question. That's a very good question. I mean, you know, the thing is, we know very little about. And very little <laughs> is, an, is an overstatement about the uh, the chemistry of the ocean on Titan. We know there is water, um, and yeah, it's true. It's not in contact with the rock mantle, and that might cause problems chemically. But it is in contact with the reservoir of organics on on the surface, not necessarily continuously, but it's got to be sporadically in contact. I mean, we see, we see cryovolcanoes, right? Uh, and so there are flows of liquid water, at least occasionally, on the surface of Titan. And there are impacts, which sometimes punch holes in that crust. And there is, are various geological processes that, over time, will mix some of that surface material into the ocean. So, uh, so you do have this liquid water environment with, you know, in a pretty unknown thermos, thermodynamic state, but with occasional admixtures of complex organics. And uh, to me, that spells out a possible biosphere. Right? But yeah, the, the, the point is a good one, that it's not in contact with the rock mantle. And some of the assumed chemistry um, that we think about for, for Europa has to do with the, the possibility of black smokers uh, on the floor of Europa, like the black smokers on Earth's ocean interacting directly with that that ocean and 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 it's true it's a good point michael that that you would have to uh that you don't expect that on titan yeah i mean uh, justin uh, why is the rock mantle contact important and, and michael's answered that question that it's a question of the uh, accessing the bio what we call the biogenic elements 
um, and 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 heat supply as well. But I would maintain that we know very little of the co the uh, composition of that ocean, and we know very little about the energy supply. We really don't know how fully differentiated Titan is. We know that at least at some level there will be admixtures of all these elements from, uh, you know, even from micrometeorites uh, falling in uh, from, from space and, and um, you know, the, the, the quantity of those elements in the ocean will not be zero. Whether it will be limiting is a good question. And what the energy sources will be, uh, you know, I just don't know. But um, but I, I, I don't think that we can rule out life in the ocean of Titan on the basis of the, the uh, absence of those kinds of interactions. Yes, the chemistry is under constraint. Very well put. Uh, let's see, John has a question here. So much effort given to keep our probes sterile and our microbes off other planets. Has anyone given thought to actually depositing some of our extremophiles on other planets? And what are the ethics and morals of that issue? Yes, yes, great, um, great combination of points, John. Um, so you've alluded at first to planetary protection, of course, the idea that we, uh, we take very seriously the ethical implications of planetary exploration and astrobiological exploration. And I'm very proud of the fact that NASA has an Office of Planetary Protection because it's, uh, to me, that's, that says that NASA is in the business of applied ethics. Planetary protection is applied ethics, and we take seriously the responsibility that we don't casually contaminate other worlds, um, and that we certainly don't want to casually contaminate Earth with um, agents that could be dangerous. But, but uh, having said that, it is tempting to think that, that we could spread life. And if one learns enough about some of these other environments to truly conclude that they are lifeless, then I think you can make an argument that the ethical imperative switches. We have an ethical imperative not to casually infect other places that, and inadvertently destroy a native biosphere. But I also think that, and this is maybe a little more controversial, but I, I think life is a good thing. And that it's, it's um, part of the role of life is to, is to spread life to more places in the universe. And so if we find completely lifeless places, then, um, you know, I think we, it, we would need to have some kind of a conversation about this, which is what we're doing. But, um, but I would argue that then it becomes a good thing to spread life. So uh, first of all, we have to learn a lot more before we can even contemplate doing this. Um, and, and people are contemplating it. Uh, Chris McKay wants to plant a flower on Mars, um, which is a, a beautiful idea. And I think that, you know, once we're sure we know a little bit more about Mars, and, and we're getting there with Mars, that, uh, yeah, let's, let's plant flowers there and see if they'll grow. And, and if we really found that we understood a place like Titan and Enceladus and, and these places that could possibly support life, and we really learned that they do not support life, then, yeah, let's, let's, let's plant some seeds. Let's, let's expand life throughout the universe. For one thing... If we do that, then we're ensuring the continued existence of Earth life. As long as Earth life is, is confined to one planet, then we are susceptible to a planetary disaster. Um, and so if we care about life, and, and we do, right, then, uh, then let's, let's, let's spread it. You know, the analogy that um, some people use for the idea of spreading life to a place like Mars is like, oh, you know, why should we go screw up other worlds like we've... we've We've screwed up our own, our own planet. But you can also think of it as, um, like, you know, a vacant lot. If you find a vacant lot and there's nothing growing there, then why not plant a garden? You know. So, so once we learn, if if we really learn enough to be confident, be sure that that some of these places are vacant lots, then let's let's plant gardens in them. So, uh, but we're we're a ways off from from being at that point. But what we need to do for, um, you know, I think at least another generation is just explore, 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 explore. Uh, let's see. Given surface radiation on Mars, are you in favor of any sort of permanent colony on Mars? What could we learn having people on the surface versus rovers? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, if it were just for science, 
if our only goal was what we could learn, then I think it's a, it's a while before we really need to send people because for the same amount of money that we could send a few people, we could send, you know, hundreds of rovers and really, and, and drills and explore the surface, explore the subsurface. And, uh, you know, there's an argument for, for, for people as scientific explorers, certainly, because human judgment uh, is so critical when you get to that sort of next stage beyond just the reconnaissance stage where um, actual people up there with tools and instruments could, uh, you know, could, could use their heads and, and do a lot more um, kind of quick thinking and, and, and explore in a way that, that, that we don't know how to do with machines. But just for bang for the buck for science, I think we're still talking about, you know, really another generation of, of robotic exploration. But there are other reasons to, to send people other than simply scientific knowledge. And, um, you know, there's, it, it, it's, um, it's a whole really set of different questions, but it's, it's sort of what we do. It's what we do as human beings. We're curious and we want to go to new places and explore new places. I do think it's, it's sort of our nature. I mean, a long time ago, we were only in Africa, and a courageous band of women and men left Africa and populated the earth. And I think that sooner or later, the next stage in that is going to be courageous women and men leaving earth and living other places and exploring further. And, and I just, I just think it's, uh, it may sound corny, but I do feel like it's part of our destiny. And, um, and people, I think people are going to do it. And the reason they're going to do it is not strictly about the maximum gain of scientific knowledge for the, uh, um, for the money. And as far as your question about radiation, that's, uh, yeah, exactly. And somebody, somebody, um, um, typed here, adventure, romance, excitement. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. That's what I'm talking about. Adventure, romance, excitement. Um, but you're right. Uh, there, there, uh, you're right, Miles. There's a, there's a tricky problem with the radiation. The surface of Mars is, is somewhat deadly. Um, I think we'll solve that problem. I mean, humans go and live places where, where they've got no right to be. I mean, look, like people have colonized Las Vegas, you know, there's no water there. But people have been to the moon. You know, I, I just think that um, that these are solvable problems. And it may be that the thing to do on Mars is dig a big underground shelter. And when there's a, a solar event, a big radiation event coming towards towards you, everybody gets gets in the shelter, and you just you know make sure you've got lots of um, good books and um, you know some uh, single malt scotch down there, and you 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 wait it out. Or, um, or we find some other solution, but, but it's a technological problem. It's not an insurmountable problem, and I think it's one that we'll figure out how to solve. No more questions? Should I tell some jokes? Maybe I should ask you guys some questions. <laughs> Somebody type something. They don't want to have dead air. Oh, Miles has a question. Oh. oh, oh, there we go. Sorry. How tough would it be to send a curiosity equivalent to Venus? Ah, ah, ah. Unfortunately, pretty tough. People have come up with designs. The problem with Venus, of course, is that it's so darn hot. It's about, um, you, you know, uh, Fahrenheit terms, it's uh, in the high 800s, almost 900 degrees everywhere on the surface. And... Um, the pressure is high, but that's not as big a problem. We know how to deal with pressure. It's not higher than than uh, we have technology that you know goes um, a kilometer deep in the ocean. We know how to deal with pressure, but the temperature is very tricky. Uh, we don't really know how to design electronics and computer memories and transmitters that work at those temperatures, and so therefore people talk about uh, designing big refrigerators, nuclear-powered refrigerators that are rather inelegant and we, we actually have designs to do that but they're the big and bulky and costly I think ultimately it will be um, we will ult ultimately learn how to actually develop electronics and develop instrumentation that are that actually functions comfortably in those conditions rather than having to surround something in in a shell 
of Earth-like conditions. But, you know, a rover, a Curiosity-type rover, is not the next step for Venus. Um, somebody mentioned uh, weather balloons, and, yeah, uh, balloons, uh, we know how to do, is not a huge technological challenge. And, and I think surface missions to Venus are important. But probably not rovers, even just landers that could last for a few hours. You know, the, the Russians had Venus landers that lasted for an hour or so, but that was 20 years ago, and we didn't have the instrumentation and the knowledge to ask the right questions. If we had a Venus lander now, a couple of Venus landers in well-chosen places, given that we now have global maps and we know the interesting places, and we have better instruments so we know how to probe those rocks. And we could really learn a lot about the history of that planet and the history of, of the climate and the, the past existence of oceans on Venus. So I think just um, Venus landers would be very important. And uh, entry probes to really explore the lower atmosphere with drop probes that don't have to last long. They just have to have good instrumentation and send the information back. Balloons. And the other thing is there's a lot more we can do with sophisticated Venus orbiters that we haven't done with um, radar interferometry, really better surface mapping. Now we know that there are probably active volcanoes on Venus. We can, um, we can nail that down and really find the active volcanoes with, with a new generation of orbiter instruments that we haven't had. So I would love to see rovers or some kind of mobility, maybe um, the other idea is low altitude aerial platforms on Venus eventually. I mean, definitely we have to do that eventually, but I don't see it as the next step for Venus. Was oh, there a touch and go land, lander balloon hybrid Venus design? Yeah, 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 that's right. So there's also this idea um, of some, uh, of, of a, uh, a platform for Venus that could touch down briefly in a place, do sampling, do observations, and then before it gets too hot, go back up into high enough in the atmosphere, 20 kilometers up or so, float around in the global winds until you get to another interesting place and then go down again. In fact, people have designed these sort of selectively buoyant balloons, balloons that, um, that have some kind of a bellows or some kind of a, um, a phase change material that you heat and cool and the density increases and decreases so you can make the thing float up and then you float around the winds and then you go back down to the surface uh, and do more experiments. So yeah, there's some kind of, there are ideas for platforms on Venus where you could have some kind of mobility and do some kind of surface science without having to solve the really tricky problem of how to survive there for hours or days or months. You know, eventually you want really long-term platforms on Venus because one of the most interesting things you want to do eventually is seismology. Probe the interior of Venus. It's the only other Earth-sized planet we can do seismology on. And it's a fascinating comparison with Earth because it is the same size almost. And so it ought to have an interior structure that's similar to Earth's, an interior dynamic similar to Earth's. And yet we know it's been wrung dry and it's desiccated and so the interior properties are a little bit different. So if we could do seismology on Venus and really understand its interior, we'd learn a lot more about that coupled history of the interior, the surface, the atmosphere, and uh, we'd actually learn a lot more about Earth by being able to do seismology on Venus. But in order to do that, you really need a long-lived surface platform, and that's, that's not going to be easy. Let's see. Any other questions? I've, have I missed any? Ah, I seem to remember you are certified for suborbital flight. Um, is that right? How does that work? Yeah. Uh, I am certified for suborbital flight. I, um, there was um, a class uh, a couple years ago now that was organized um, to train a group of scientists to be suborbital astronauts. Um, and I was among that first dozen. Um, and I found out that I at least have enough of the right stuff so that I did not throw up on the... Um, on the centrifuge when we went up to uh, six G, so that was uh, that was good to know. Um, it was it was actually challenging and a lot of fun. And the next step is for the suborbital flights to start up. You know, there are all these companies, Virgin Galactic, and and these other competing companies that are uh, getting ready to start sending people into uh, into uh, space and, and on suborbital flights. And the idea is 
that rather than have it just be for rich tourists, let's have a research and education component on the suborbital flights. And in some ways, they're really good research platforms and really good education platforms. And uh, it's been gratifying to see that the, the uh, consortium of companies preparing to do these flights has been very opening to broadening the mission beyond just tourism and having a research and education mission associated with these. So that, that is happening. And, and a lot of us who are, are trained are just kind of waiting for these flights to get going. And, and yeah, I would love to go up. And, and what I would love to do is some kind of educational uh, the educational project where, for instance, uh, I can imagine being up there in space in weightlessness and talking like this, but to uh, a, a um, classroom or, or an auditorium or many auditoriums full of kids and have some kind of two-way conversation and can be like, whoa, I'm in space. Ah! And they would, uh, you know, ask me questions about uh, what, what it feels like and what I could see and, and have some kind of a have some kind of a two-way conversation and sort of share the experience and uh, hopefully inspire curiosity and, and, um, and uh, spark, some, spark some, some young minds. So that's, that's one thing I would really love to do. Um, let's see. Ah, I see some questions popping up here. Um, let's see. What do we need to do to learn more about exoplanets? And how important are exoplanets? Well, they're hugely important. I mean, th this is a revolution in knowledge happening right now that's, uh, you know, equal to, to any revolution, I think, in, in, in human knowledge. It's, it's absolutely, it's actually absolutely huge. The, um, the idea that there are other planets out there is, is one that scientists have long kind of assumed or thought was reasonable. Uh, you know, when I was in grad school in, in the 80s, we didn't know about exoplanets, but we learned about the formation of the solar system as kind of a natural byproduct of the formation of, 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 of our star. The stuff that's left over from forming the star coagulates and accretes into planets, and that ought to happen elsewhere. So we kind of assumed for a long time they were out there, but it was a, a weird kind of scientific faith, a belief that wasn't really supported by evidence, or at least it was only supported by inductive logic. And now, of course, we've started to find them, and we're finding that they are, as a lot of us suspected, commonplace, that, that when you look up in the sky at night, a sky full of stars, you know now that most of those stars have planets orbiting them. So that's, that's a huge change in what we really know about the universe. And, you know, you can look at this progressive progression in history of things that we sort of assumed and now we know. Going back even to, you know, the 1600s, some people assumed that the stars might be suns. And then we discovered, yes, the stars really are suns. And then we kind of assumed, well, if they're suns, they probably all have planets around them. And then we discovered, actually, that's true. They do all have planets around them. Well, now we still have this assumption some portion of those planets probably ha ha have life on them. And that's still something that, that is a kind of faith. It's a kind of scientific faith. By inductive logic, a lot of us assume it must be true, but we don't have the evidence. So can we move that from this assumed belief column into the observed fact, a known fact column? I think we will, but obviously a step along, an important step along that direction is the discovery of the exoplanets. Now, as far as how can we learn more about them, it seems crazy that we could learn very much about them. They're so darn far away, we don't even know about them for the most part by even seeing them directly. We infer their existence indirectly by the way they, they move around their, their companion star. And yet, amazingly, we've started to learn a lot about some of these exoplanets. And I, I'm just blown away by the creativity and the uh, imagination and the ingenuity of this this generation now of, of mostly young scientists that are making it their career to learn something about the exoplanets and doing these very clever observations of you know if when a when a planet passes in front of a star how does the spectrum of the light change 
what is being subtracted and added to that spectrum by the surface or the gases on that planet. Um, you know, a lot of very clever techniques looking at these very, very subtle effects. But the progress that's been made already in just the first real decade, I'd say, of exoplanet observations, without even having instruments that are optimized for that, using instruments that were built for other things, is really encouraging and inspiring. And what's going to happen now is that we're going to build new instruments, new, te new space telescopes that are really designed for the purpose of learning about these exoplanets. And we're going to start to learn what their atmospheres are made out of, how reflective their surfaces are, um, how, um, how their reflectivity changes as they rotate, which tells us something about whether they have continents and oceans and uh, you know whether we can see the glint of oceans reflecting off them. And people are just going to keep coming up with these very clever ways of learning new things about exoplanets, some of which we, can't even, we haven't even thought of yet at all. And so um, the direction, you know, the arc of <laughs> exoplanet science is long, but it bends towards knowledge. <laughs> sorry, to, uh, sorry to bastardize uh, Martin Luther King there. But, um, but the, uh, you know, the, the, this is uh, the way things are going. And so we're, we're going to learn a lot about these, these places. And sooner or later, we're going to discover one that's got such a weird atmosphere that it's telling us that there's probably something living there. Um, ah, which feeds into this question. What sorts of things should we or could we look for to see evidence of other biospheres on exoplanets? How hard is it to see those things? Well, again, uh, it's hard, but the, the signs are encouraging. The, the fact that people are learning to do these very clever observations. And, and a great way to look for life on an exoplanet is to look for a really weird atmosphere. I mean, what's the one planet we know of with life, Earth. And what's the planet with the weirdest atmosphere? Um, you know, it, it, it's Earth. I mean, look at our neighbor planets. Venus, all CO2, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but basically all CO2. Mars, all CO2, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, basically all CO2. And then you look at Earth and you go, whoa, wait a minute, there's something weird about that planet. What's all this oxygen? And there's even methane mixed in with that oxygen. That shouldn't be there because methane reacts with oxygen. Something is happening on that planet maintaining this strange atmosphere. That something is life. And I think that, that finding flagrantly anomalous atmospheres is uh, right now is our best shot of finding a biosphere on an exoplanet. And I don't think ultimately it's going to be that hard if we build the right instruments and keep going with this this amazing effort to extract information from those the small number of photons of light that we're, we're capturing from these from these worlds. Have you read about any Venus-like extrasolar planets and how excited are you to study their data? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we don't know enough about very many of these exoplanets to, to be sure that there's there are any that are Venus-like. But I wouldn't be surprised because I think Venus-like planets are probably common in the universe. I mean, CO2 is CO2 dominated atmospheres are going to be common. CO2 is just, you know, it's one of the things planets do when they have rocks and they make volcanoes and they they put CO2 into the atmosphere. So it's almost like the the normal state of an Earth-like atmosphere is is CO2 and a certain number of those planets are going to be on the what we call the, the inner edge of the habitable zone or inside the habitable zone where they're they're hot enough so that they lose their water in a runaway greenhouse, which is what happened to Venus. And so I think that the Venus-like state of, of terrestrial planets will be common. And so I think we will find Venus-like extrasolar planets. I wouldn't say that we've discovered any yet that are dead ringish for Venus, but, I mean, this is in its infancy. And we, we may have. We just don't know enough about them to, to be able to say that. And I think it would be really exciting, really exciting to study them. I mean, the, the fact that, that there's this diversity of planets coming down the pike so that, you know, in, in the terrestrial planet game, we've basically had three, three planets to study, Earth, Venus, and Mars. And, and it's been very fruitful, that comparison, but it's, it's a very limited data set. And now there, there are going to be hundreds, hundreds coming down the pike, and we'll really get to characterize and see how weird Venus, Earth, and Mars are, how they fit into a wider spectrum. So it's, uh, it's, it's something to look forward to. Okay, time for one or two more questions. Do you think we will more likely discover life via atmospheric detection or evidence of technology, aka radio waves or the like, on exoplanets? 
ha. Ah, um, gosh, that's just such a hard question. Um, I don't know. I think that it's incumbent upon us to search for life in any way we can, which means exploring our own solar system more fully to really know if there's anything weird going on on Titan or these other places we've talked about, to look for anomalous signatures on in the atmospheres of exoplanets. Of course we have to continue our SETI searches um, by uh, looking for uh, radio waves or artifacts or astroengineering. You know, we just don't know. We're ignorant and uh, we have to keep searching. If I, if I had to put money on it, um, which I don't, fortunately, but if I had to, I would say that the most promising possibility is finding uh, an exoplanet with a truly anomalous atmosphere that just cries out life. Because that's something that we know is coming down the pike. We know that before too long we're going to build these instruments and we're going to have good atmospheric signatures for you know, dozens, hundreds of exoplanets. And so if, they're, if, if life planets are not extraordinarily rare, then we'll start to find them, right? Uh, but, but there's always wild card discoveries that could happen in SETI. Se Seth Shostak points out that SETI searches are becoming sort of exponentially more powerful, and therefore he predicts that, that uh, SETI search will have success in the next 20 years. Maybe he's right. It's certainly worth uh, continuing to, uh, to search for, for that long and a lot longer. Um, do you have any input into the atmospheric detection instrumentation? Um, I don't, uh, well, I mean, I sit on committees that make recommendations. Uh, so in a broad sense, I have input. I am not personally an instrument builder. That's not what I do. So I'm not the person with the most input, but I, uh, I know what I like <laughs> when I get asked to sit on committees, um, you know, I um, try to point out things that I think would be useful. Doesn't it seem logical that life on some planet somewhere in the universe has faced, is facing the same type of Anthropocene challenge, changes or challenges we are seeing on Earth? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, that's one of the things I'm trying to do with, with my work here at the library is look at the, the Anthropocene from this lens of, okay, what is really going on here? from a planetary transition point of view. How can we abstract this? And I think that a planet with life, will uh, life will become a global phenomenon. And a planet that develops complex life is likely to develop, you know, intelligence. Whatever, and we could talk about what that means. But because cognitive abilities are a big survival um, boost, and the niche that human beings have filled on Earth with these flexible brains and, uh, and, and social, being social creatures with, with flexible brains able to solve problems and create technology seems like a niche that will evolve under selective pressure on other planets. Once you have that niche and life is becoming technological, then I think it's only a matter of time before they have this sort of Anthropocene moment or their own local equivalent that we're having now and realize that, oh, we're affecting our environment globally in ways that may not facilitate our long-term survival unless we start to think of ourselves as a global entity and change the way we do things. That's the moment we're, we are at. And yes, I do think it's likely that that would happen elsewhere. And, and how life responds to that challenge will be what determines the longevity of life and intelligence on that planet. And thus, any life, any intelligent life we find elsewhere, I think, will surely have reached this moment and somehow gotten through it. And so, for one thing, if we find extraterrestrial intelligence, I think it shows that that, that Anthropocene error, <laughs> that challenge that we are facing now, is a solvable problem. And so, in that overall sense, I think it would be a very hopeful thing to discover. How are we doing, Sanjoy? Are we, um, that almost seems like a final point, but. Shadows of Percival Lowell. Well, yeah. I mean, the thing about Percival Lowell is that he was the first guy to do uh, comparative planetology, right? And so we diss his specifics, and he, 
he came up with some loopy stuff, but he also got us thinking along the lines that we need to be thinking in terms of comparative planetology. So let's not let's not completely dis personal. Hey, thank you so much, Sanjoy, for arranging this, and thank you all for participating. It's been really fun for me, and thank you all so much for the for the great questions. Let's do it again sometime. You're all invited over to Sanjoy's house now for beer. <laughs> Hey, Batul. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> everybody, everybody, hollow and hoot. <laughs> oh, beers on Thursday. All right. <laughs> He'll post the address later. All right. I guess uh, I guess we're gonna sign off. Now, right? All right. Take care, everybody. It's been really fun.